let us begin. Um, and I will come to you, Barnaby. You, you can, you can, you can state your case. Are Tottenham fans entitled? Are we right to be entitled? How do you define entitlement? Your own yeah, thank, please. yeah, thank you, Rez. Um, I think this has uh, accidentally all come because as a title to a video that I made, I put, are Spurs fans angry and more entitled than Arsenal fans? I mean, I, frankly, let's be honest, that is a little bit clickbaity. I'll be, uh, I'll be realistic about that. I think what I was talking about really is I do think there is a corner, what I describe as a corner of the Spurs fan base who seem to be kind of incredibly negative about Tottenham, no matter what happens. Now, what I would say is, under Jose Mourinho and under the very short time time uh, term of Nuno and uh, the back end of Antonio Conte, things were definitely getting toxic both in and out of the stadium. And I would say, arguably, um, rightly, uh, I think the football was unpalatable. And uh, I think the strategy behind the scenes was not mirrored with the type of managers that we had appointed. Um, and therefore, I think there was at that period every right for Spurs fans to just feel like things were slipping away from us, having been in such a great situation under Pochettino, a situation where actually I think we were ahead of ourselves in terms of what was the plan of the Northumberland Development Project, which you know, I think started way back in 2008, that being the plan to grow the club via infrastru infrastructure um, in the way that the rules allowed clubs to do. Um, so Pochettino, I think, kind of got us ahead of the game. And then things got really bad under Mourinho and Conte and everyone had a right to be negative. Now, I personally, and this is only my personal opinion and what I was saying on the video, I personally think that actually we're now in pretty good shape and things are looking good going forward. Now, that's not to say that uh, I don't hear and understand the argument of um, one trophy in Enix time, because a lot of, a lot of this negativity stems uh, about Enix, Joe Lewis and Daniel Levy. But I also think there's a lot more to it than it to be just as reductive as saying one trophy in 24 years. And, for instance, comparing it to the previous 24 years or the previous 24 years before that, which I know a lot of people do. I think, unfortunately, the game has changed. And when I say the game has changed. What I mean is people have come into the game and have, have basically cheated the system uh, financially and in a way that hasn't allowed Tottenham to have the success it would have had, uh, albeit ahead of schedule, um, had that not been the case. And I think all of these kind of things need to be taken into account. What I would also say, though, is obviously a lot of this discourse happens over Twitter, where everything is kind of stuck to 142 characters and everybody gets very upset very easily. And um, And also, I would say, there are people on Twitter, and I'm not suggesting it's these people in this debate, but there are people in Twitter who realize that they get more engagement from saying something that is overtly negative or um, abusive at times or offensive than if they say anything kind of authentic or realistic, which is kind of more where I am when it comes to being a Spurs fan. I should also add, just you know, in my opening statement, that you know, I, I think I've been accused before of being a Daniel Levy apologist or a happy clapper or whatever the terms are. I'm by no means Daniel Levy in or Daniel Levy out or Enoch in or Enoch out. I am a Tottenham Hotspur fan and I want Tottenham Hotspur to be the best they can be. I want them to play entertaining football. I want it to be to dare is to do. I want us to have the kind of ups and downs and journey that I had a little bit in, in when I first started supporting them in the late 80s because I'm pretty old, but then really lost in the 90s. Uh, and actually that has kind of picked up again in the last... 10, 12, 14 years, obviously with the peak being the Champions League final that I was so fortunate to go to and that I never, ever imagined in my lifetime I would see Tottenham Hotspur at. And the reason I bring that up is because I think, you know, it's very easy to forget that and it's very easy to, to not realise how lucky we are and to think that the grass is always greener. But to suggest that any club that doesn't win a trophy or doesn't win trophies is a failure, for me, it kind of belittles what football is all about and it suggests that everyone other than the top five clubs, two or three of whom are, or definitely two of the top five clubs over the past 15 years have been cheating the system. And I think, I think there's more to football than all of that. And that's why I feel that actually we're in pretty good shape. I think Ange Postacoglu is a good manager who I think we've found at the right time and suits exactly what this club should be all about. That doesn't mean everyone's going to agree with me on that, but I'm willing to have the discussion as to why I think that is the case. And... Um, yeah, I think that pretty much covers it in terms of an opening statement. Thank you for giving me the uh, opportunity. Okay. 
So still, your statement. You're on mute, mate. Yeah, look, I hear Barnaby covered a lot there. So I made quite a few notes as Barnaby was talking. So my statement's more of a rebuttal to what Barnaby said. Sure, sure. I have a complete opposite view to what you said, Barnaby. And um, my view is this. You, you say negative. By having a different oh. view, it's automatically labelled by so many fans. And, and you, you, you are an example of that. You just did it. You label it negative because you've got a different view. It's, for me, I'm not negative. I'm realistic. We, we talk about the last four years being toxic. Well, who made it toxic? In my view, it's all on Daniel Levy. He 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 made that period toxic. It's all, it's all good and well for him at the start of this season to say we've got our top them back. Well, who took it away, Daniel? You did. Um, to make it toxic. Well, Pochettino wanted a painful rebuild. <clears throat> he sacked him. Spent five hundred million pounds on transfers over the next four years on four different managers. Well, there was the rebuild money. Where would we have been if we kept Poch and did the rebuild? Instead, we got him Mourinho. Um, he got sacked before a cup final. With the manager or or toxicity. Daniel Levy's creating these toxic issues. We then bring in Conte on a two year contract. Who brings a manager in on a two year contract with a with a serious ambition of being successful? And, and then he brings in Conte and gives him players like Clement Longley. I mean, with all due respect, Ange, Ange was given Van de Ven and Vicario, two outstanding, they've turned out to be outstanding players for, for key positions, whereas players like Conte were given Clement Longley and Fraser Forrester, who they're awful compared to what we've signed now. And then, you know, we... I can't sit here and say now, after all of that, it's all OK. Because for me, it's not. And the reason it's not okay is because I haven't seen anything under Ange that I haven't seen in the last five, six years. Have we been poor in the domestic cups? Yes, we have. Are we in nothing more than a top four race? Yep. So for me, it's the same old, same old. I don't think the football is amazing. I think there's four or five games this year where I watch Spurs play. And I think Ange has got a better team than Conte, by the way. And I look at this team... And I think we've had four or five games where I'm really impressed. And then there's a lot of games where it's been patchy and at times not, not, not a good watch. Against Luton Town, it was the first game this season. The fans booed. They booed the team off the pitch. I've never heard that this season. So the football isn't great. It's, it, it, is, is it better than Conte Ball? Yeah, it is. But that was pretty, pretty dire. But we had a dire team. We had terrible players. I think we've got a much better team, but fair play, Ange doesn't have Harry Kane. So for me, it kind of balances out. And then, you know, you, you, we talk about how the football landscape has changed and then there's cheats in the game <clears throat> and there's financial doping. Well, how did Leicester do it? Premier League and FA Cup. Arsenal, four FA Cups. Liverpool, they've won everything. They're not financially doped. They've had to contend with those clubs that are financially doping. It just seems Spurs can't do it. Why, why is that? And to wrap it up, I want what's best for Spurs as well. I also support Spurs. I just don't see how we do it with a chairman like Daniel Levy. And until he changes his ways, and changing his ways means previous patterns of behaviour completely change. And I know what I'm looking for, and I haven't seen that yet. I'm not convinced. I'm not Ange out. I don't want him gone. I backed Conte. I backed Mourinho. I backed Poch. I backed Redknapp. I backed Joel. I backed ABB, damn it. I'll back this manager too. But... The patterns need to change. And for me, the patterns have not changed. It was impossible for the atmosphere not to be better, no matter who came in this season, as long as they played a bit of attacking football. And I think that's hoodwinked a lot of fans. OK, so it seems like the terms of the debate here suggest an optimistic versus apologies, a slightly more pessimistic view of the current leadership at the club okay so we'll come to you sonny for your statement but the key thing that we are looking to discuss or explore is whether or not as fans we have a sense of entitlement and whether or not one side of this debate encapsulates that or whether it's something a bit more widespread throughout the whole of the 
the fan base. So mm. in your view, Sonny, are we being entitled to expect more from the club? Um, I would say of what has been said so far, like when I launched my YouTube channel at the start of the season, I called for this ownership to be sold. I, you know, have never been the biggest fan of Levy because, you know, I was supporting the club since the Martin Yole season and I've seen all the stuff that's been stated already, not spending in a calendar year. But what I saw this season from Levy was... Personally, I feel like he's trying to change, but I st I take that with a pinch of salt. And I say this a lot on my channel. For what Levy is showing, you know, he's showing all these revenue streams and lots of profitable, you know, concerts and a go-kart track and all that sort of stuff. And how he's maybe taken a step back this season. You know, he, we haven't heard much from him since the beginning. He sort of brought in the likes of Scott Munn, Johan Lang, Paratici, who seem to be pulling more of the strings. And then maybe he's doing more of the business stuff and he's let Anne sort of express himself. And so my point of view is I, after, you know, I didn't enjoy the Jose Mourinho era, the Conte era, I believe with what Stell is saying, from my point of view, I, I believe personally that, Levy didn't want to back these managers because it was that short-term fix. I, I personally think he didn't want to give them a war chest per se because from my point of view, I feel like Conte didn't want to be at the club. You know, the way that managerial merry-go-round went, it was sort of like the Southampton was him handing his resignation in that day. Whereas I feel like with Ange Postacoglu, he wants to sort of be at this club, you know, invest in this team and grow the side, whatever that may be. Um, so that's why maybe um, Ange has been backed in the summer by getting his centre-back, his creative midfield. You know, we all say we haven't had a player creatively since Ericsson. So from that point of view, that's how I see it. But when it comes to the fans, I mean, Arsenal fans are entitled. <laughs> that's some of the most entitled, you know, big six United fans are some of the most entitled. They think they should be winning the league since Fergie left and all that sort of stuff. I think... Personally, you know, I've seen one trophy in my lifetime. I'd love to see more than that. I'd love to see constant top four success, competing from trophies and all that sort of stuff. But it, it, it's I, I understand the thing is, it's probably because I'm a bit of a younger generation of a Tottenham fan. And that's not me saying everyone on this call is older than me. And, you know, <laughs> my I, I talked to my dad enough who is... You know, he was a season ticket holder during the sugar days, and he tells me some of the some of that was like some of the most abysmal abysmal stuff he's ever seen. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm just a bit optimistic because I've I just some of the stuff I remember during the COVID season and Conte, like I'd get angry, I'd get so irate. Whereas now I'm trying to like start from a bit of square one again and hope that one Levy turns a corner, which as I say, I'm not sure if that's gonna happen. Um, the jury's still out on that one. But but what I've heard so far from Ange and what I've seen so far this season, I am positive we can head in the right direction. I don't know whether we will, but, you know, I think every, every fan at this football club has got their entitlement to any opinion they have because at the end of the day, we pay the ticket prices, which are a joke as itself. We all know that. Um, you know, we we me buying a shirt funds this football club and all that sort of stuff. We deserve to have our opinion. But obviously, I, I have it in my comment section, some of the negativity where I just state a, a, maybe like a simple point where I'm just saying something like, oh, maybe Levy is changing and someone will jump at me. And I'm just saying, oh, no, I think I, it could. It could. I, I don't think it will. I did a video today where um, I was stating that may, maybe are we potentially turning this corner, but how slowly are we going to be turning this corner? We've got, to, we've got to act now. We've got to invest. We've got to really back this manager because personally, in my opinion, I think we could have a good thing going. So the question that occurs to me is, and obviously we know people can't speak for an entire fan base. It's not possible because there's going to be differences of opinion. But broadly speaking, and we'll come to you, Maz, for your statement. What are Spurs fans' expectations, really? And is it a realistic thing for us to expect whatever the broad expectation might be, Maz? I think we need to define what success is for Tottenham fans. And our history would tell us that success is um, winning trophies because up until um, 91, um, 
in terms of where we were at compared to the other uh, top six clubs who were, we were quite successful and we were known as a trophy winning team. Um, and uh, as the guys alluded to, we had, um, you know, darker years than normal um, following the Sugar era. Um, and then I would argue into into the Levy era as well. Um, in terms of entitlement, well, if you look at what the what football is, what the Premier League is, elite sport in general and competition in general, the, the whole point of uh, being um, in a league table um, and charging fans to watch their teams play is to win football games. Now, there's different ways of winning football games. Our tradition shows us that we're a team that plays good football. Um, you know, the pass and move um, team um, that, that famed us around the world. Um, and, and that is part of our identity. And we lean on that identity um, in terms of the expectations we, we look to now. What I find very contradictory a bit of cognitive dissonance here is in, in in the sense that fans want good football because that's what we've always played, but they're willing to say, well, we want good football, but we don't want the trophies. But you can't separate those two things. We were a club that were known to play good football and win trophies for majority of our um, existence as a club. So to, just to dispense with your history and say, well, you know, things have changed and now we're not, uh, we shouldn't expect to win trophies anymore. And I'm not talking about the league because we've never traditionally been a league winning team. Um, I think is, is uh, does a disservice and a, and, a, and almost uh, doesn't honour our, you know, let's call it quote unquote ancestors um, in terms of who helped build this club. Um, and the pattern that I've seen over the last uh 20, 30 years is the willingness of fans to lower their standards, to give excuses to the failures that we're seeing today, rather than deal with the failures um, as they come up or, or face them head on. I mean, a lot of other clubs and fans are willing to do that and make their voices heard. And for some reason, we're not. Now, this could be a byproduct of um, us um, nearly going into administration under Irving Scholar and, and uh, Sugar saving us etc and then we were traumatized by that almost like ptsd um but for me um what what i find incredibly unsatisfactory is the fact that fans um have got to such a a, a point now where they're willing to um a, allow low resolution thinking as to every 18 months when we change manager just wipe the slate clean let's not deal with the problems that we've just seen um, for the last 18 months or, or further back, let's just look forward. And what's happened is, is by taking on that attitude, we haven't actually improved. And Barnaby raised um, us comparing every 25 years or every 20 years in terms of stats. But what that does show you, uh, aside from the fact that you can't really run away from what the stats show you, is that we haven't actually improved. In fact, we've got worse um, as the <clears> decades <throat> have gone on. Um, so... I'm not sure entitlement is the right word to use because to be entitled, to feel entitled about something, that means you, you, you do the, the thing that you're, you're, you're lacking happens regularly and you're, all of a sudden you're not having it anymore. Well, it's been such a long time now that I don't think we're entitled, but we certainly are angry. And certainly I am angry about what's happened because it's robbed me of 30 years of not seeing my beloved club be successful. Okay, thanks for that, Matt. So, okay, we're going to open it out now a little bit. So, by all means, guys, you know, do talk at each other. Feel free to interject. Obviously, if you want to talk about something specific um, that someone said and you want to interject, by all means, do so. But if you can raise a hand, that's better. So, I'm going to come to you, Barnaby, um, as the person who started, obviously, so you've been waiting the longest. Okay, some fans will argue that, and what Maz has just said, is that by lowering our expectations season by season, we are ultimately accepting mediocrity. Is that the view that you have? Or do you think that maybe we're setting our sights a little bit too high, perhaps? Maybe we should be realistic about where we are as a club. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, Maz said there that, you know, you, 
I don't know, it might have been a slip of the tongue, but you said you, you basically said that people say we don't want to win trophies or we don't care about winning trophies. It, it, I don't think I've ever seen anybody say that. I'd be very surprised if I saw someone say, oh, I don't want to win trophies. I think it's just more for me that the reality of um, where Tottenham Hotspur were as a club when Enoch took over, by which I mean, you know, the size of White Hart Lane, the realities of how far we were behind Arsenal and Manchester United, those clubs who really were challenging, is that the club and the owners of the club had to put in place a plan in which we could get as as big as those clubs are or try and get bigger than them whilst doing it in a sustainably run way. Now, I understand that obviously the natural response to that would be, oh, well, why couldn't we just have an owner who just does it all straight away, which Chelsea were fortunate to get if, you know, if you're happy with that being the way you do it. And Manchester City were were fortunate to get. Um, but I don't know. I, I don't, it's not like I've listened to what you guys are saying and I don't understand it. I, I understand where you're coming from, but I think it's just more of like a, for me, it's like a, I'm kind of enjoying the journey. You know, I, I am. And you you talked about, um, uh, Stell, you went back to, um, you know, the Pochettino, the Pochettino painful rebuild and stuff. There's stuff, there's stuff that gets said that is kind of held up against Daniel Levy. For instance, you know, uh, specifically when he said we have money to spend, the money is ring fenced. Nothing that happens in terms of the build of the new stadium will affect the transfer budget. I think it's that's kind of used as a stick to beat him with. But it it would have been terrible business if he'd come out and said, "Oh no, we've got no money and we're not going to be able to spend any money for two windows." And we would have had the best players of ours cherry picked by the bigger clubs if he had so, had done. But since then, we now know, and I think anyone realistic would have known at the time, but Hugo Lloris has come out recently and said we weren't able to spend any money because of the amount of money that was being spent on the stadium. And the reality is, I think it's worth bringing that stuff up because it's almost like you can't have those moments of success that we had under Pochettino and and how close we got to the promised land and not give credit for the growth of the club to get to that point and then almost almost kind of put that aside as if it didn't happen and just say, oh, it's all been terrible for 24 years. I, I, I just don't think that is realistic. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm wary of talking for too long, but that's kind of where my mind goes straight away, having heard you guys. Yeah, but, uh, okay, I hear what you're saying, but I go by what the chairman said. So if he lied to give a perception of something else, I'm only going to go by what I've heard. If five years later, Hugo Lloris comes out and says, well, the chairman lied because... He had to protect our assets. Mm. I didn't know that at the time. And to be honest with you, I, I don't I don't buy what Hugo Lloris says because a lot of players came out, including Eric Dyer, all in defence of Daniel Levy. Well, of course they're going to defend him because they stayed here for nine years and won nothing and, get, and got paid for it. So they've had the best boss in the world who doesn't hold players accountable. Yeah, stay here as long as you want. We don't have to win anything. Yeah, cool. I'll take the money. And when the stadium went over budget by £200 million, we found the money for that. We had no problem finding an extra 200 million pounds to, to complete the, 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 the super stadium that increases the, the wealth portfolio of Enoch and Levy. So the, re the reality was that there was, there was no desire to genuinely do the maximum they could to genuinely try and win silverware. I think Poch um, punched above his weight. Daniel Levy even said um, in the Amazon documentary, I got lucky with Poch. He even admitted that, his words again, unless he was lying again. And for, for, for me, the reason I beat Daniel Levy with a stick is because he's had 24 years. We're now into the third decade of this manager, and, and you're sitting here telling me I'm enjoying the journey. This, this journey's been almost as long as my life, Barnaby. I'm still on this journey, right? Whereas in 10 years, I've seen a Liverpool ownership win everything. I've seen an Arsenal ownership win four FA Cups in the worst period I've seen Arsenal in a long time. I've seen a Leicester ownership in 10 years win an FA Cup charity shield um, and uh, a league title. Yet this man, 24 years, I'm being told project, process, plan, journey. At what point do we say this is beyond the joke? I'm not against Dan. I want to make this clear. I'm not against this process. But I've not seen anything different yet to suggest that this is any different to anything before that I've seen. A bit of structural change in terms of the football side, where we've now got more football people involved. Lange, McKenzie, 
Paratici, Mun. Fair play. Maybe, maybe like Sonny said earlier, maybe Levy is changing. But until I see it and I see it delivered, so if I'm, I can I'm interject not, here, I'm not, I'm not, I'm if not I can interject here, Stel, yeah. just that's the question, actually. This is the this is a key question. What mm. would it take for you to be convinced? That's the key. If I mean, you know, what what would it take <clears> for you to say, do you know what? I think we're on the right track now. For me to be convinced, Rez, I need to see two things. One, when we get back to that place that Poch took us, which is kind of where Arsenal are now, we go and do what Arsenal did. Hundred million pound debt from Rice. Let's bring in a real. Let's bring in a proper game changer. Let's let's spend some serious money, and not just stop because we've got to top four. And secondly, it's the pattern of how we behave in the transfer market. I'm sick of seeing us spend 150 million, 200 million pounds on eight or nine players. Go and spend that money and buy three or four top proven players. But what I'm hearing Ange now say is we're not going to spend big money on superstars. We we. We'd rather spend it on three, four, five players instead of one top player. That's what worries me. Now, whether Ange is playing the game, maybe he's lying to the media as well. He's lying to us as well. And in five years' time, Van de Ven will come out and tell us, actually, that's why he said it. I don't know. I'm going by what I'm being told now. So to answer your question, when we get to that competitive level where we're genuinely knocking on the door of greatness like Poch did, don't take your foot off the gas. Double down on it. And two... Stop spending mega money on nine players in hope they all become great when only two or three turn out good. Go and buy three or four proven quality players and take us to that next level. Like when Liverpool signed Van Dijk and Allison, like Arsenal signed Declan Rice, like when Man City last year they signed two players for 160 million, Halland and Grealish, and they went and won the treble. Otherwise, what was the point of this stadium? So that's that's what I need to see, Red. I just want to add something as well to, to Stelio. So when 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 you when you when you ju when you're judging what what people are doing, you know if it, if it looks like a donkey and it acts like a donkey, um, and it runs like a donkey, and it mopes around like a donkey, then it is a donkey. And 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 what um, Daniel Levy um, has shown us is he's distinct lack of treating Tottenham Hotspur as a proper football club that wants to win trophies <clears throat> and invest in the football team. And I just want to read an extract um, about um, Daniel Levy um, and, and why he came into the club. And then let's reflect back on the 24 years as to what he's actually done um, in, in reference to that. So it says, Lewis employed Daniel Levy as a family friend, as an investment manager at Enoch. The strategy was to build an international sports and entertainment group to profit from the media interests. Then Daniel Levy states this. The excitement was purely the gamble to earn millions. There is no passion here, said Levy, admitting that neither Lewis nor himself was particularly keen on football. This is purely financial. The football he believed was commercially underexploited, particularly in, in television revenue. Now, if you take that statement and you map that out as to what's happened to Tottenham Hotspur in the last 24 years, to me, it's clear that he has no intention or not even the intention, but winning for him is a byproduct of him building a big football club as an investment strategy for Enoch. So the things that Stell wants to see in terms of have... Tottenham change have Enoch change has Levy changed that that will never happen because we can see in them wanting to build this new hotel next to Tottenham Hotspur Stadium and the areas around it and the training ground that there is no intention of us being a successful club so whether or not you enjoy the what's happening now and the journey now is irrelevant because what that means is that in the next 10 years we won't do anything Right. And fans that are of the age of 40, 50, 60 years old are going to be another 10 years older. And God forbid, they won't ever see their team win a trophy. How can we be happier about that as fans? Can I just say so one thing quickly and, and yeah, then I'm going to let yeah, Son yeah, and then I'm going to yeah. let Sonny talk just because yeah. I thought about it. If that was the case, if Daniel Levy didn't care whether we won or not, why would he build a training ground at all? Why would he have spent all that money on the training ground? The stadium's one thing, because like you said, that could be a ruse for an entertainment thing. But why would he build the training ground? It's not a ruse. He said that with his own words, right? And 
Um, if you want to build your, your portfolio and your assets, then you've got to develop it and you've got to build on the land that you own. So if you're going to expand your portfolio and the, and the wealth of the club, you've got to build to do that. And infrastructure is the main way that Enid can know how to build a successful business because that's what they are. Just to play devil's advocate on this one, Barnaby, there, you could argue, and I'm not, I, again, I'm not, I'm not interfering with thing, but you could argue that uh, as the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium is going to be one of the venues for the Euros that are going to come up, I think it is, um, a training ground is necessary. So it's so you can get more use out of the stadium. Although the flip side to that is there's more money coming in, which could be pumped into the team as well. So there is to, there are arguments beyond just he's looking out for the Tottenham Hotspur team, well, can, but at the same time, there's arguments can, for the other can, side. Let's, let, let's bring Sonny Chris, in here. Can I, the, the, the key, yeah, go on. Go Chris, on can, I, just, I just want to say, the reason he's developed the training ground and the reason he's developed the academy is because, yeah. one, if you don't have an academy, it's a PR disaster. A, a working in new football, you've got to have an academy. But the training ground, <clears throat> he doesn't want Spurs to get relegated. <clears throat> He doesn't want us to develop good teams. Top four is crucial to this man. The money from Champions League and, and us getting in the Champions League is the reason why we were invited to join the European Super League. The reason we're, we're, we're at the table is because we got into the Champions League. So he needs to maintain that. The training ground supports us being able to continue being a top four club. Okay. Sonny, uh, what we're talking about here, it seems to me, is that essentially we're talking about a process. And I hate to use that term because that's what the old olive tree planter uh, over at the scum likes to talk about. But there's a process going on. Have we waited too long or is it worth us being patient? That's the, I, that's the key question. Yeah. I, I think this, is, this has come a bit too late. You know, I believe that Pochettino should have been back a, a bit like what Stell said. I, what we needed to do was invest like Liverpool did. Because you look at like Liverpool and maybe Arsenal and the way they've sort of gone around their business, Tottenham should have maybe done that sort of thing of, you know, a couple of good stars to improve the team. Because we knew it was ageing. We knew the likes of Vertonghen and Alderweire, they couldn't go on forever. And then when they got too old, the likes of Harry Kane, he realised he hadn't won anything and he's gone to Bayern Munich where he might not win anything again. I think what maybe the club are trying to do now is this whole process of rooting out. Because we, we have spent money. I'd like to say we, we have spent money, but it has been on dross. And... And I don't know if that's to do with the likes of Steve Hitchin and the scouting network. It's been it's been terrible because you know we spent sixty five million on a Tangi and Dombele, and he can't even run around the pitch for Galatasaray right now. So what I hope to see with this process is just that the club, and maybe this is where I understand the guy's point. Like sort of you have to remove the head to sort of you know extinguish the beast to be like. Well, it's all good bringing in the likes of Johan Lang and Scott Munn and all that. But while Levy is still there, can it actually work? And obviously, these guys think think it doesn't. I I am of the impression of I think Levy is good for the club in the sense of business. If that's all he was doing, if all he was doing was business, I'd be happy with him as a as an owner because he knows how to bring in great revenue streams. He knows how to get Beyonce to do a concert. But the bit I think is funny is out of all the neg negotiations from the last two years which which negotiation was buggered up the most meant it cost more and hasn't worked out jed spence and who was in charge of that daniel levy whereas all the other ones the fabio fabio paratici signings they've all you sort of lit up the league but i just hope my point of view is that Le levy has to change because at the end of the day you know it, it, he he's going to end up you know going further down the line and you know it is it's all well and good you know having a profitable club as it is now but in a couple of years time you not might not be able to attract the best players and could literally look at this and go well I'll just bugger off to Liverpool they've actually got their structure in place so I, un I understand this argument from both sides of the coin because I, I like to be optimistic because I, I, I'm, I'm a bit sick personally when I was neg a negative fan not enjoying like Jose Mourinho coming out with all his BS and Conte feeling like he it was his it was an honour for him to be here. He was he felt bigger than the football club. Whereas from an Ange point of view, I think Ange he he feels like he's doing us a service and he he is the you know personification of Spurs. I'd like to think. Whereas Levy isn't like I, I understand the argument. See, I, I I'm not the biggest Levy fan. I think I've reiterated that, but. I mean, I'd like to phrase it to the guys, like, you know, 
has Levy scorned you so much that you you, you just can't look at him in the in in a positive light? You know, if he if he if he does this, say say come the summer we spend a good a good chunk on some players, we bring in you know and gets backed. You know, w- would that actually change your guys' view? Because that's where I, I'm I'm trying to head to that position of I'd like to be more optimistic about it, but I understand so, that. Sunny, so, I, I mean, yeah. so, let me ask you a question, right? <clears throat> this summer. Let's say we sign Timo Werner on a long-term contract, <laughs> right? I'm not, going to, I'm not going to ask your views on Timo. It's, yeah, yeah, each fan's their own. Do you look at Timo Werner, hand on heart, and say, and really wants that player? Or do you look at it as a club signing? I mean, that would, yeah, that, that's it's, it's set up because it's 17 million euros or whatever. That, that's got Levy's name written all over it. But Right. So, so, so if we do sign him then, mm. based on what you've said, it's got Levy's name all over it. That's not Ange being backed. So hmm. I'm looking at things like that this summer to make my decision. I'm still on the fence at the moment. But yeah. if, if, for example, we do sign Timo Werner on a long-term contract, I'm, I'm done with it. I, 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 yeah, then, then to answer your question, yeah. Then how I feel about Levy, I feel even more. But if we don't sign Timo Werner and we instead sign – it could be another Van der Ven – Esque or a Vicario esque player that I, I've never heard of, but blimey, look at them, they're really good, mm. mate. I'm happy with that. I can, I'm, I'm realistic, but if we sign Timo Werner, stuff like that, nothing's changed for me. No, I, I understand, com- understand that completely because that's that. I mean, even when we were signing the likes of Vicario, I, I questioned that, thinking, oh, that like I wanted yeah, David yeah, Raya, I wanted David Raya, yeah, yeah. but that's why I'm hoping that Levy but, has actually got a brain cell left to go, well, if I change the structure of this club then, you know, and I'm not... Uh, Sonny, are, See, we not drawing, are we not drawing a conclusion about Timo Werner based on the fact that he's finding it difficult to put the a ball in the onion bag at the moment? Because, and it's a valid point, we can only go on what statements are said, and Ange Postacoglu said that he did want Timo. He even said that if he was putting the ball in the back of the net, we wouldn't be able to afford him. That is alarming to me, but can we be certain about these signings about whether or not no. they are as we say club signings or that they are actually what the manager wants you see my, my view on on that res is that a, a, a lot of the signings that we have made which which have been good uh, well mm. two of them at least have been very good um were through absolute necessity so um, we were absolutely dying for a center back and we got van der ven um, but we did actually miss out on uh, Tapsoba, who was our primary target um, for, for for that window. Um, we were we got Vicario for absolute necessity of um, needing to replace Lloris because he downed tools at the Newcastle game, and you know he wasn't willing to do another season. Um, but we you know we missed out on David Ray, and we got Vicario. Thank God we did. But you know, and and Madison, in my eyes, was effectively to appease the fans because we lost Harry Kane. Now, those when you look at those three signings, to me, that's got the hallmarks of what we do every single time we're in a crisis situation. So the, the real Ange signings are, for me, are Timo Werner and Johnson. And whilst uh, granted that Johnson is a, a youngish player and he potentially he has potential in the future hopefully sooner rather than later i haven't really been that impressed with either of them because i'm looking um for for angie's signings to effectively set the tempo of what we're going to look to in the future you couple that with the statements that he's been putting out and i'm not very optimistic unfortunately barnaby yeah, I mean, I, I, I just to say, Maz, like I value everything you're saying, mate, and it's all subjective. But to 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 try and to pick and choose which ones are and signings based on your feelings on it, that doesn't work. They're all and signings because he was in charge when they were signed. That's that's yeah, how it no, granted. Works. And, 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 and I, don't, same... I don't think any of us know, though, do we? So I, I can only I can only put conjecture as to what I think they are. Um, right. Anyway, uh, I, I wanted to I wanted to go back a bit. Um, just because I'm hyper aware we're kind of running out of time a little bit. But I want to talk more about transfers in as a general thing and some of the things you guys have, have brought up. Um, and kind of specifically about, uh, you mentioned, you know, Arsenal's ability to buy Declan Rice. He talked about, um, 
you know, our inability to push the boat out financially. I mean, I, I think when thinking about transfers for Spurs, what we have to realise is we are fishing in the transfer waters after the, the clubs that are bigger than us have cherry-picked the best first, okay? So when it comes to the reality of, you know, we should be spending much more money on two players rather than, you know, eight or nine, as as um, Stell was saying, I think I think the reality is is that we're not able to get the big players at the money that we would want to because they've already been cherry picked by Man City. So you know Jack Grealish, you mentioned he went to Man City because Man City went for Jack Grealish, and Man City are able to pay three hundred grand a week because they're owned by Abu Dhabi. Um, in terms of you know uh, what's been talked about quite a lot uh, as why you know why aren't we pushing the boat out more now that the stadium is built? Well. The Emirates was built and finished in 2006 and Arsenal didn't properly massively spend money until 2019 when they bought Nicola Pepe for £75 million. They did get Ozil in in 13 and gave him a lot of money. But even that is, you know, 2006 to 2013, that's seven years. We haven't made it to five years in the new stadium yet. We've got a lot of loans on it. It is still going to be affecting things. That's just the reality of it. So from 2006 to 2023, when they bought, when they spent £100 million on Declan Rice... That's a lot of years. So that stadium build is still affecting the amount we are able to spend. And we've got to, I'm afraid, in my opinion, be patient for that stadium to give us the financial strength that it definitely will. It's already giving us more probably than we thought. Let's also bear in mind there was the uh, the pandemic in the middle of that stuff as well. As well as that, in terms of transfers, when you talk about the kind of players that Arsenal and Man United can buy, well, they're legacy clubs with huge fan bases and therefore a lot more money coming through the door worldwide from the kind of shirt sales and stuff like that. Spurs have not been a a big legacy club. We haven't won the league since 1961. When I went to Madrid for the Champions League final, Madrid was 95% Liverpool. They came from everywhere, all around the world. They're a huge club with a huge fan base. But Liverpool have also been in huge trouble with with their owners. They had George Gillette and Tom Hicks, who nearly run them into the ground. And then their fans don't even like John Henry. Arsenal fans didn't like Stan Kroenke until Mikel Arteta was given the chance to to turn round what was a bad start with him. So I just think, you know, there's a lot to be talked about in terms of the the depth of, of how much stuff happens when it comes to this transfer stuff. Like also on top of that, let's be real, let's be realistic. If you put yourself in Daniel Levy's shoes, he would pro- he probably tells some people every time I break the transfer record, it doesn't work. So let's let's think about it. Richarlison, hmm, jury's out. Undombele, Sanchez. You can go back to Rebrov, Soldado, Postiga. Musa Sissoko, he spent £35 million on. I mean, you know, he became a cult figure, but not a good enough player. Lo Celso, Lamella, arguably, Darren Ben. All of those players, when he spent big money, didn't work. In the first few seasons when Enoch were in charge, we spent more money than Arsenal did. And Arsenal were winning the league because we were trying to play catch-up. Spending money, as Everton have proven, as Chelsea have proven, it doesn't work. It's not as simple as that. It doesn't always work. And especially if you're... Hold on. And especially especially if you're fishing in the transfer waters where you're getting the leftovers from what six or seven other clubs around Europe have already taken. Okay. So, look, mindful... Hold on, Stel, one second. I'm mindful of the time here, guys, right? So, what we'll do, we'll go around. We'll start with you, Stel, okay? A couple of minutes to rebut and to make some final statements. Just keep in mind the final question or the question of the actual debate. And if you could bring up the two um, starred comments that I asked you to, please, Stel, one from Robert Young, one from DB. So, the question that we started the debate on is whether or not Spurs fans are entitled can be described as entitled for wanting whatever it is that we want. I don't think we've actually scratched deep enough to come to a definitive conclusion, but we started a long time ago, half an hour ago. So Robert Yee said, any points about entitled fans contradict the entire ideal of a fan. How can you be satisfied for a sports club being financially secure? The flip side to that, which we had from DB a couple of minutes after, was the entitlement is sickening. 100% agree with Barnaby, who has ever started supporting Spurs to win trophies. Isn't possible. We just love the club, good or bad. Moaning is part of it. So if you can each do your closing statements to that and keep that in mind uh, when you do. And Stel, you wanted to rebut what Barnaby was saying. 
Yeah, I, I actually can't believe what Barnaby said. I, 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 listen, respectfully, it sounded like a PR script that Levy would read out. We have been spending big money since 2019. Mourinho spent almost £200 million. Conte spent over £200 million. Us and our ability to spend money is not an issue, right? Daniel Levy is a brilliant businessman. He's made sure since the stadium's open that we do have the resources. Resources are not our problem. Our problem is how we spend the resources, right? To say that we can't attract top players is nonsense. We can get Carabascalia to this club. There are top players in Europe that we can bring in for 60, 70 million pounds. We choose not to do it because we go for the cheaper options too often. The reason the big money signings have failed, like the Endombele's, like the Dav uh, the Sissokos, the um, Davinson Sanchez, because they're all unproven talent. None of them came with pedigree. None of them were household names. We had to Google them all. Okay, Sissoko we knew because he played for Newcastle, but he wasn't tearing up trees there. We badly spent big money. If we went and spent £60 million on a Bamiyang like Arsenal did, we wouldn't be complaining because he was tearing it up in, in the German league. We spend big money badly. That's the problem. As soon as we signed Richarlison, half of this fan base were like, 65 million. What for him? We knew it wasn't a great signing. We have the money. We have the ability. We can attract players. If we go toe-to-toe -to -toe with City and Liverpool, yes, they're going to go to those clubs. But yeah. we're not going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe for every single player with them. We are bigger than Everton. We are bigger than Villa. We are bigger than Brighton. We can compete for top players with other clubs. Yes, if Arsenal come into the equation, we're up against it. But that doesn't mean we can't sign quality players that are proven in the game. So I, I don't I don't buy that. For me, that, that that's an easy way out. The players are there. It's the strategy that's wrong. I think you Keep just agreed playing. with what I said, though. I think you just agreed with what I said, which no, is that we're, only, we're only money. able to get we're only able to get the players that have been turned down by the teams that are bigger than us, and we're trying to grow as a club to become bigger than them. No, because if you go into a play, if, if you go for a, if you go in for a player that the other club doesn't does, doesn't isn't looking at or, or hasn't got an interest to buy, then you're not being turned down because they're not going in, Barnaby. I agree. If we go toe to toe, but how often have we gone toe to toe for a player with another club in recent times? The only two I can think of was. Uh, Diaz, who went to Liverpool, and William, mm -hmm. who went to Chelsea. Other than that, we've never gone toe to toe with those clubs. Well, Ma Madison and Newcastle, I'd say. Okay, but I, I, I look at us as bigger than Newcastle, though. So I'm talking about the the, the clubs that I think are, are bigger than us, the, the so called top six. So we 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 choose not to do it. We we would rather sign um, a, a player that is a risk or somewhat not of a proven level or on their way down, like a Loriente, a Timo Werner, for example. Once in a while, we do we do we do spend a decent amount of money, and we get it right. Like a Van de Ven, I think he was like forty five million pounds. He's proven to be worth maybe eighty million pounds. But in general, Spurs have never ever ever gone for that proven quality player. We can do it, and 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 the best time to have done it was when we had Pochettino. We just lost the Champions League final. We we were seen as a big club. We were on the up. And we didn't do it. We 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 went and bought an end on Bele and a and a Le Celso and a Ryan Sessignon. And it's like, oh, what are you doing, Tottenham? So I I I don't agree with that. And um I, I want to be quick because I know you guys uh, have got to go, but regarding the thing about being entitled, look, it comes down to what kind of fan you are. If you're a fan that's here just to be entertained, it's about the experience, the journey. It's about feeling part of a, a community and, and you've chosen the Spurs community. You've got the club that you want. You're happy. You're, you're going to enjoy it. But if you want to be part of a club that is labelled the big six, then start behaving like a big six club. You've got to be serious about silverware. You've got to be serious about competing at the highest level and not to keep sacking, firing, changing this guy, changing that guy, new director here, this player hasn't worked out. It just seems like a merry-go-round, merry-go-round, merry-go-round. Maybe it will ch change on the Ange. Maybe this is the time and Levy changes. But I need to see it first to believe it. I, I'm not entitled. I, 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 I demand more than one trophy in 24 years when I pay the highest ticket prices in Europe. And I demand more the one trophy in 24 years if we're going to call ourselves a big six club. Otherwise, stop this big six club conversation and say it for what it is. 
We're a top six business, probably top three. We're not a big six club. That's how I look at us right now. We've got to start winning silverware. Otherwise, what is the point of this? What, what are we doing? Because half the time I'm not entertained, guys. So, but again, entitlement. It's in the eye. It, it, it's subjective, I think. Sunny? Um, I just, after what Stel was saying as well, I think you can put a lot of those issues at the foot of Levy, but I think it is a recruitment thing as well. And you've, I mentioned Steve Hitchin earlier, you know, what he said on the documentary, which was PR anyway. You made Jose Marino look better than he was as well. But, you know, we saw in the last week, I think they've got ridden three other scouts. Can't remember their names on the top of my head. But maybe if we're going to go down this route, and I've said it, if we can get our recruitment better and stuff like that, we can beat the likes of Brighton who can pluck a player out of nowhere, Brentford. You know, we that's where I think we'll be shopping. And as you look at you look at Manchester City this season, they've picked up Doku. Has he really impressed? Gavardial, you know, those sort of players. So I, I, I'm with the agreement. You don't have to spend mega money, but if you spend it strategically, you can get to get to better places. And I think Tottenham hopefully can do that. I'm still not fully in the whole entitlement thing. I think every fan's entitled, whether you're in League Two wanting to stay up, a powerhouse, you know, in the championship who deserves to play Premier League football up and down the country. I think fans are entitled. It depends what the entitlement is. It's like I said earlier, Manchester United fans who think they should be where Fergie was. It's it's not a guarantee. Chelsea fans who moan like stuffed pigs. We're used to winning Premier Leagues every other season. Well, you're, you're not there right now. All, my closing statement is just that what I've seen so far from Ange... Um, I've been impressed with. I think there is a lot to still work on. Don't get me wrong. You know, the Fulham result, even Luton the other day, it's, it's not it's not there just yet. And I know people will say 20, 24 years, but I, I feel like when you have to reflect on this with Ange and Levy and all that, it's probably at the end of next season to see where we are. If we're mid-table and <laughs> nothing much has changed, then I feel like the arguments can come back up. But at the moment, I'd say, you know, we've still got the chance of finishing in the top four. We've got some good players coming through. Van der Ven, Vicario. I have hope for the likes of Brennan Johnson. Um, and, yeah, hopefully uh, Timo Werner can lead us to a title next year. <laughs> <laughs> Maz? I'm joking. That was a joke. That was a joke. <laughs> uh, that was great. Don't pull on that thread, Sonny. We <laughs> nearly made it an hour. <laughs> um, I, I think that when when you have the highest ticket prices in, in England and, and in Europe as Stel says that you should expect um, a certain level of um, success and uh, in, in terms of recruitment um, again shit rolls downhill so um, if we didn't um, fire higher and fire 18 different managers in in that 24 year period then maybe we would have had some level of consistency in terms of the structure of the club and and the recruitment teams etc cetera, etc cetera. um i think i think sunny's closing statement was was good in the sense that all fans are entitled um it depends on on what you're lacking um you know in, in terms of your entitlement so um what i would say is is that we shouldn't every season we shouldn't be having these same discussions you know if you I'm, I'm pretty sure if you every every year we're having the same discussions over and over again um and i'm not happy to have the same discussion next year when we don't win anything and we're talking about the same old things as you know timo werner and johnson and whoever else we decide to pick on at that top point in time and the last closing statement to you barnaby I actually, um, I agree with what Sonny and uh, Maz said about entitlement. We, we all have our own levels of entitlement in life and in, in football fandom. I just want to, you know, I'm willing to give this another kind of five minutes. I know I said I had to go, but I just wanted to ask one question of you guys, because this is really important to me when it comes to the, um, you know, when I talked about entitlement, I, I guess I'm saying it's that, it, it's, that, it's, <laughs> it's, that in, it's that entitlement to me of feeling like, you know, we somehow deserve better, or if we were to do something different, by which I guess we're talking about finding a new chairman or a new ownership model or ownership structure, that we would automatically do better. For me, I would love to ask you guys, um, if not Levy and Enoch, who? And, you know, and I'm not saying, you know, pluck a, pluck a business, I'm not saying pluck a businessman out of the sky. I'm talking about which other chairman do you look at in the Premier League of the last 25 years and say, oh, they would have done a lot better job because just off the top of my head, starting with 
Um, you know, you said Liverpool did a great job uh, and have won everything, and they have, but their fans don't like the way that it's gone there. And that money they spent on Allison and Van Dijk, as you mentioned, came from selling Coutinho, which the fans at the time weren't happy, but arguably could we have sold Harry Kane back in the day for, you know, 100, 150 million and spent that on two top players, maybe, but also maybe top players of that ilk wouldn't come to us because Liverpool are sniffing around them, right? So just that as an, just using that as an example, or would you prefer, would you prefer a kind of one of the states that hasn't come into the Premier League to come in? And at which point my argument would be, well, Saudi have come in to get Newcastle and they're not able to do anymore what Abu Dhabi did at Man City because of the rules. So I'm just guess I'm, I'm just asking like, if the grass is greener, what is that grass? Uh, and, I, and I'm very happy to, you know, if you've got an, I'd love to hear an answer because like I said, I'm not Enoch or Levy in particularly. I'm just not sure exactly what the answer to it is. I'm just going to interject very quickly and say one thing on that question. I'll, you know, by all means, you know, answer. However, criticizing what you have doesn't necessarily require you to know what you don't have. Yeah. It's perfectly feasible for us to criticize a chairman, a manager, a player, let's say, and not necessarily know who you would replace them with. That's what I'll say going into that, because that's a little bit of a bugbear for me. I know I said I wouldn't interject in this debate, but that one is a little bit of a bugbear for me. So I just wanted to make that clear. Right. But I'll throw it open now, guys. By all means. I, I, I think it's impossible to say who I want, because I could say, right, I want Tesla, Elon Musk. I want him tomorrow. Right. That means nothing. Right. That means, what if he doesn't want it? I, I don't know. Right. So it's impossible to tell you who I want. What I do like is what I'm seeing from, and I, this is going to make me sick. What I'm seeing from Arsenal, it makes me sick. Stan Kroenke, every sports club he's owned has gone on to win major honours, whether it's baseball, NFL, ice hockey, they're winners. So there's a sports winning pedigree from that man. He's now come to Arsenal. He's only been the majority owner of Arsenal for five years. But the same patterns that he installed at those clubs, he's done at Arsenal. And I'm, 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 I'm petrified that they're going to go on and be really successful. But he's got the background to back it. They've changed the outside of the stage and the decor. They've got fan forums to make the, the, the atmosphere and, and the club more fan orientated. It, it just looks and stinks. And I say stink because it's them. That they're putting football first. Fans engaged with the whole thing. I look at Tottenham and look, Barnaby, I want to see an owner that puts football as the priority and makes it the number one thing. We're a football club. We're going to do everything we can to make it a great football club. But it's always, are oh, we going to do a hotel? Are oh, we got concerts? Are oh, we got, it looked great. We get it. It's all about the revenue, but that's got to amount to something for the football team. It can't just be top four, top four, top four, crashing out of domestic cups. Not one stand, like the, 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 how we're made to feel. Not one stand named after a legend. Not one statue of a great manager or player of our club. They've only just recently put the clock up, the, the Spurs clock, because of fans complaining. It shouldn't be like that. Be proactive, make it a football club. And then do you know what? If you make us a great football club, I don't care what you do with the NFL and the Beyonce's and the Formula Ones. Do as much as you want, because you know what? I've got a football club at the heart of it. And I just feel they're too much business, not enough football. So I want an owner that understands we're a football club first. I don't think Levy sees it that way, although he'll give you sound bites that, you know, we are that. So that's kind of where I'm going to share. Yeah. And I, I just want to quickly add, um, a, lot of, a lot of the companies that come in, and certainly the owners of, let's say, Man City, Liverpool, um, they want to come in and... and their aim is glory, not to make money. Maybe less so for Liverpool. Um, obviously, Man City is owned by a, by a country, but uh, their, their prime priority is, is glory, and our prime priority is investment and building hotels and F1 under the stadium and things of that nature. And uh, and football should be the focus. And then you can make as much money as you want. But if football is not the focus, then uh, What's the point? And the final 
comment to you, Sonny? And then we're going to wrap up. I'd say it's hard to compare with Manchester City because obviously people bring in sports washing and, uh, you know, a lot of their commercial revenue, we don't know if that's all legitimate. When it comes to good owners, the the best currently in the Premier League are probably the likes of Brighton, but they're operating at a smaller level. Obviously, you know, Paul Barber, Tony Bloom. I mean, I think one of them is a Spurs fan. One of them was at Spurs. Was um, was that Paul Barber, I believe? Yeah, he was. So maybe... Uh, but with, with the Cronky argument, I think that's what's quite interesting, thinking like, you know, he's become the majority. He's changed. He has been at the club for a little while. I think that's what some Spurs fans hope of Levy, but... I mean, someone said it in my comment sections earlier, can a leopard change his spots? And that's that's probably a good question to end on because, you know, as, as I've said, I'm not I'm not, I'm not Levy in um, and I'm, 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 I'm flirted with being Levy out a lot in the last couple of years because of some of the wild decisions he's doing. But I think I'd like to believe that in this current model, if he is like, because... Since the start of the season where he did that speech at that university, we haven't heard much of him. I've not really even seen pictures of him and Ange together in public. So that's quite telling. Um, obviously, we don't know what happens behind closed doors at the training ground because he does look like he is close with the managers, what we saw from the Amazon doc. But I'd like to think if, if he took that back step fully, if he just dealt with the business stuff and let football people in this football club, get the fans involved, you know, let the likes of Johan Lang do the scouting network, Scott Munn run the day-to-day -day like the likes of Liverpool do. Because Michael Edwards has gone in there now. I know he was there before. He's going to be running the show there and, you know, big job for him to replace Jurgen Klopp. But that's that's what we need. We need football people in charge of what we're doing because we've seen it at Chelsea. They've got Americans in there who do not know what they are doing. They're just chucking money at it. And I'd never like us to just end up being that as well. Like I'm not happy with how it is and I'm not I wouldn't be happy if it was that either. But if we can sort of just tweak what we are maybe currently doing under Ange Postacoglu, I, I'd like to think we could get success in, you know, getting back to I want to see more trophies. I want to, I've only seen one. <laughs> so I want to see more success uh at this football club because it, it drives me insane just occasionally saluting one off performances and you know oh we got to a Champions League final but I wanted to lift it. So yeah, I'm, 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 you know, I flirt between glass half full and glass half empty, but I think that's that's the fun of being a Spurs fan, hey?